Today's message is entitled Carriers of the King. Carriers of the King. I'll lead you in a prayer and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pray myself. So if you could put your hands on your hearts and pray with me. Dear Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life in your precious name. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you have in store. Lord, feed us with your word that it would strengthen us, that it would wash our eyes and our ears, that we would be transformed by your truth and lifted up. And that Holy Spirit, you would be honored I'm asking that you'd speak through me and that we would hear your voice clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. So before we get into this, uh, we're doing this fundraising campaign where our goal is to raise $2,000 per month of reoccurring giving. So if you, we want to thank everybody who's a part of giving. And if you want to be a part of that giving and uh, help the ministry to burn bright, you can go to brisbanefire.com and the give page, brisbanefire.com and the give page, and you can give. And thanks for your giving. Thanks for your tithes and offerings. Amen. Amen. So now let's get into the message. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. Again, the message is entitled, Carriers of the King. And today, we will turn our attention to Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And this is a week before His crucifixion and His resurrection. So it's a week before His crucifixion and resurrection. This is his entry into Jerusalem, the last week of Jesus' earthly life. And it connects well with Psalm 24. So this is Psalm 24, part 11. (laughs) So part 11. (laughs) Now, Psalm 24, part 11. It connects well with that. And Psalm 24 is all about calling the King of glory to come into his holy city. So the triumphal entry is part of the fulfillment of Psalm 24 where we are calling Jesus to come. We're welcoming him. So let's read Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find the donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey." And on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Amen? So that's where we're going to be dwelling this morning. But let's also flip to Psalm 24 and read part of Psalm 24. And I'll start in 
Psalm 24, 5, and I'll just edit the NIV a little bit because I, I want to bring out that the Hebrew is saying that they will carry a blessing. Here it says they will receive a blessing. So they will carry the blessing of the Lord and vindication from God their Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek Him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is He? This King of glory, the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. Now notice it says, who is this? In Psalm 24, it also says, who is this? In Matthew 21. And it reveals who this is who's coming in. It's the King. It's the King of glory. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. So let's go back now to Matthew 21. It's on my heart to engage with the text in a, a stream of consciousness way. So reflecting on it as the Holy Spirit leads. And firstly, I like to bring out that, that the first, uh, first passage where Jesus is speaking or the first words He's saying so we have here, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village of ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there. And later on, I want to speak about donkeys and uh, what it means and how we can apply this. So there's a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that. This is the first thing I want to bring out. I, found, I find this one of the most profound statements in Scripture. The Lord needs them. Or the Lord has need of them. Think about that. Think about that statement. Jesus is saying the Lord has need of them. And so if they're questioned in getting these donkeys there to say the Lord has need of them and He will send them right away. How can the Lord of all the earth need anything? We read in the beginning of Psalm 24 verse 1 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And then we see here, here's the Lord's, everything is the Lord's, the earth is the Lord's, everything is the Lord's. But here we see the Lord Almighty needs, the Lord has need of them. And then how could the Lord of all the earth need anything? Well, this is the great mystery of God, that in Jesus becoming flesh and blood, he has made himself vulnerable. He has, made, he has humbled himself. He needs. We know he needs to sleep. We know he needs to eat. Uh, we know he needs these donkeys. It's not that God absolutely needs anything, but rather something that's come up in Bible school, rather is God has chosen to need in other words, he has humbled himself and put himself in a place of need. And also he has chosen to enter into covenant relationship with us so that he is not doing things on earth without us. God has chosen to need us. And this is why prayer is important because God doesn't do everything without our prayer. There's certain things He will do, but there's certain things He will not do unless we pray, unless we seek Him, unless we ask Him. And here the disciples are being given a task. They have to go out. They have to untie these donkeys. They have to bring these donkeys back. 
And it's all for a purpose because it fulfills Scripture. It fulfills what it says in Zechariah chapter 9. We'll turn there very soon, but not right now. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you. Now we would expect the king to come on a horse. The most royal and regal animal there is. But here he comes on a donkey. And this is something that reveals the humility of Jesus and the humility of God. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey. The whole idea of this is God's gentleness, his humility, his kindness. He is royal, but he is using the most humble of vessels. And then we see also the coat, the fowl of the donkey. The child of the donkey is also there. He's not straddling both as he rides them. It's, it's probably likely that he has his possessions on one of the donkeys and he's riding on the other. And maybe, maybe one takes him so far and then he transfers and rides the other donkey. Then there's another statement here. And so I want to talk about the donkeys because it's a, there's an interesting verse in uh, Genesis 49, 14, which talks about Issachar being a strong donkey. So we tend to think of the donkey as a, uh, it, it's an animal that people often uh, curse and they're upset with the donkey. But donkeys are very, uh, in God's eyes, how he made them, they are quite amazing creatures. And here, Jesus chooses a donkey. And the donkey carries the king. And we need to learn from the donkey because we are meant to be carriers of the king. We're meant to be vehicles of the king. He needs us to bring his royal presence into Brisbane, into our towns, into our villages, into our workplaces. He needs us. And he has chosen to need us. And he wants, to, he wants us to bear him and carry him. And that's why I call this message carriers of the king. Now when we get to Matthew chapter 21 verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. This is a beautiful portrait of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Just this, the disciples went. Amen. Jesus spoke, the disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. Amen. 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 <laughs> Jesus spoke, the disciples went as Jesus had instructed them. We tend to complicate the faith. Yeah. We all do it. But it's having a relationship with Jesus, it's listening to him and carrying out what he says. And so they went and they untie the donkeys. Now think of yourself as a donkey. First, if you're going to be a vessel for the Lord, you're going to need to be untied, freed, liberated. And that's what disciples do. They untie they set people free so that they can be used by the Lord and so that they could carry the king. Amen? Amen. Now, some characteristics of a donkey. One is that they're humble. Yeah. They're humble creatures. Another thing is they're known for their service. They're serving. There's nothing really glamorous about a donkey. But you'll see that it is a sign of blessing. It, the, you'll find donkeys all throughout Scripture. With Abraham and Isaac, when they were going up to Mount 
Moriah and Abraham is about to offer Isaac on the, you know, sacrifice him. As Abraham is going to sacrifice Isaac, you'll find that they're using a donkey to carry their possessions up. And so when we see the donkey, we're reminded of Abraham giving his one and only son Isaac on the altar. And so you'll find a donkey there bearing the burden, uh, carrying probably, we see Isaac carrying the wood, the donkey would have been also carrying certain things that were needed for the sacrifice. So donkeys are known for service, strength. They have great strength. They carry burdens. They are lowly and gentle. According to the law, they're unclean for consumption, so you can't eat them. Israel's first king, Saul, if you read the story of Israel's first king, Saul, it, there was a whole, uh, uh, whole thing with uh, Saul losing his father's donkeys. And then after he is anointed, then they find the donkeys. So there is an association there in those two stories of the donkey and the anointed king. And here we have Jesus, the anointed king. After the, don after the donkey brings him into Jerusalem, he's anointed. He's anointed with all those uh, fragrant oils, very expensive oils in Matthew 26. So you can see a correlation there between Saul and Jesus, the first king of Israel, and the last king of Israel. Jesus is the last king, the final king of Israel. He is the king of kings and the Lord of, Lord of lords. We find donkeys associated with blessing, and we're called to carry the blessing. Psalm 24 calls us to, uh, or, or describes his people as those who carry a blessing, carry a blessing. Uh, Nasa is the Hebrew there. That's why I like to translate it as carry. It's the classic word for carry or bear. Um, they carry a blessing, and there's no greater blessing than Jesus himself. That's why we're, we're carriers of the blessing. Donkeys are loyal, hardworking. There's also something very interesting about a donkey, and I checked this, you know, checked if this was a myth or not, but every donkey has a cross on its back. Every donkey has a cross on its back. And if you can't see it, if you shave the fur, it becomes visible. So this is from Don Maton, the president of the Donkey Society in Western <laughs> Australia. So I went right to the top, the head of the class, the president of the Donkey Society, Dawn Maton, Western Australia, and she says this, they've all got them. They all have these crosses. And if you, if you shave, if you shave them, if you can't see them, if you shave them, they have this cross-like shape. Now there's all sorts of myths about how they got them but God is the one who created the donkey in the beginning and we have this shape of the cross and if we are to be learning from these donkeys we are meant to be those who carry the cross and by carrying the cross what we're doing is we're carrying the king we're carrying his presence that's what it means to carry the cross some other interesting things about the animal, the donkey. In Hebrew, it's chamor, chamor. And for those who know Hebrew, you have the word in there, mor, or mor, or mar, which is bitter. So in this word donkey, there's the word bitter and myrrh. Myrrh is also mor. You have the word bitter. You have myrrh. It's also the word for grief and bitterness. And chamor is also a heap, a heap. Uh, so you have heard of the home, the measurement, is the, 
in the Bible, the Homer, which is coming from, uh, it's like this word donkey because donkeys carry heaps. They carry burdens. There's also a bitterness about the donkey's uh, role. The donkey's, uh, yeah, it's, its purpose. There's a bitterness about it. And yet, how great is it to carry the king? Yes, amen. What greater privilege it is to carry the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And there is a wordplay with Chamor and Heaps in Judges 15, 16 with Samson. Uh, and I, I'd like to show you this so you can... Maybe see, see something that you normally wouldn't see. Judges 15, 16. Then Samson said, With the donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With the donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Uh, that's the NIV. I need something more uh, literal there. Does anybody have a more literal translation? Uh, Judges 15, 16. Anybody have a King James Version or a New King James Version or an NASB Version? ESV. ESV might be good. Do you mind passing that to me, please? Okay. So Judges 15, 16. Sorry, Anna. That's all right. And Samson said with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. And what this is, is a wordplay in the Hebrew because you have donkey, which is chamor, and then heaps, which is also chamor. So there's a wordplay here. With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have struck down a thousand men. So there's a wordplay there. The greatest burden we can carry is the burden of God's presence himself. And God's word himself. God wants us to throw off all the other burdens that are weighing us down and really embrace the burden of carrying Jesus himself and throwing off everything that keeps us from being a Christ bearer. So we're called to be like these donkeys that carry the King Jesus. And we must always carry the blessing, the Lord himself. We are the Lord's vehicles. Now the donkeys fulfill a prophecy in Zechariah 9. So let's turn over there to Zechariah chapter 9. If you have your Bibles. This is Zechariah prophesied from 1520 to 1518 B.C. So we're talking here 500 years before Christ was born and we have this prophecy here this is also why the lord needs these donkeys is to fulfill this prophecy prophecy and i'll be i'll read it from zechariah 9 9 what matthew is quoting from rejoice greatly daughter zion shout daughter jerusalem see your king comes to you righteous and victorious lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. And then it talks about how through this, Jesus is going to come, the Messiah is going to come and bring peace. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace. Shalom. He will pro proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So we see the Messiah is for Israel, but more than Israel, he's for the nations. He's for the people groups. And we have all different nations here, all different people represented. This is fulfilling prophecy. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Australia is part of those ends of the earth. Yeah. So this is already being fulfilled 
And it was quoted in Matthew. And then it goes on to say, As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Isn't that... Um, did you hear that? Can I say that again? Because of the blood of my covenant with you. And Jesus made this covenant with his own blood. A week, uh, less than a week later, we're going to see Jesus is crucified, shedding his blood on Good Friday. Now we're at the point of the triumphal entry. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners. I will free your prisoners. So that's the power of the blood of Jesus. The power of the blood of Jesus unties us like those donkeys. The power of the blood of Jesus frees us from our prisons, especially the prison of guilt, shame, sin, whatever the enemy is locking us into. The blood of Jesus frees us. And it's saying here from the waterless, the waterless pit. And then it goes on to say, return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. There's another beautiful, unusual phrase. Prisoners of hope. Prisoners of hope. That we should be those who are, one way to see this is, we should be those who are captive. Captive with hope. And that, even in our confinement, we are still in hope, living in hope. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. So that they had, they had lost and they were in a, a very difficult time and they were rebuilding the temple in Zechariah. And yet the Lord promises, and this is through his a covenant with us, I will restore twice as much to you. Then there's more here. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and I will fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your son Zion against your son's Greece and, I, and make you like a warrior's sword. So now I, I don't want to explain all of this, but I do want to highlight that end part where the Lord is saying, I will make you like a warrior's sword. This is the purpose of the Lord freeing us, setting us free, is to make us like a warrior's sword, to make us sharp, to make us strong in battle. And so he's freeing us so that we could be warriors, his warriors, and he's making us a warrior's sword. And we are his weapons. In, in his hands, we are his weapons. Amen? Amen. As we saw before, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. A beautiful picture of what it means to be a disciple. And then, we're almost, we're almost near the end here. We go back to Matthew 21. That's okay, I don't need that, thank you. Matthew chapter 21. And soon we're going to hear from Daniel Hang. So Matthew... 21, look at how they welcome the Lord to come in. Verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. Notice that they placed their cloaks on the donkey. And then after that in verse 8, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. So all these people are taking their cloaks and they're putting it on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. That's why this is called Palm Sunday. They're taking the branches, they're putting the palms down. They're also waving palms in worship. But I want us, again, to, I want to draw our attention to the cloaks. Now, what are cloaks? Cloaks are, it's like jackets. It's like a large jacket. Jo uh, cloaks are used to comfort. They are used to warm us. They are also our identity. And, uh, oft and, and Scripture could 
They could also be our security too. They are taking these cloaks, which it, it, at this time of year in Israel, it's cold. It's cold. While it is springtime, it's not spring like Australia. <laughs> it is a cold season. They are ta- that's why they have cloaks. But they're taking off their cloaks. They're taking off their clo- cloaks and they're laying them down. And this is what worship is. And this is how we prepare the way for the Lord to come. We lay ourselves down like they laid down the cloaks. We also lay down our warmth, our comfort, our identity in order to point to him. It is about his glory, not our glory. It is about his praise, not our praise. So they are getting their attention off of themselves and putting it on the Lord. And this is something we should do every time we gather for worship is we are laying down our cloaks. It may be uncomfortable. We may feel a bit cold. And I'm, I'm very happy with the baptisms. We had the baptisms. And it was a beautiful time. Five people baptized. Vanessa was one of them. Congratulations, Vanessa. We did it at, oh, we could do better than that. Congratulations, (laughs) Vanessa. Um, This was a a beautiful time. We did it at night. Uh, There was an urgency to do it, so we did it during our Bible school time. We did it at night. It was about 9.15 at night. Many people were looking on. Some of them were taking video, even we didn't, know, we didn't know who they were, but they were taking video of the baptism. And they were, uh, they were looking on, and at night we wondered, is the water going to be cold? But no, it was perfect. It might have been cold when you first get into it, but it was perfect. I have done baptisms, though, that have been very uncomfortable in the winter, and the water was freezing. Uh, freezing at first, and then all of a sudden... I felt it almost supernaturally getting warm, uh, more than just a physical thing. But yet, it is amazing when you take off your cloak, how the Lord himself cloaks you. His clothing is much warmer than our clothing. So we may be holding on to our cloaks, thinking we're keeping warm, but how great it was that they took their cloaks and put them down Put, laid them down so that Jesus could have a way, a road, a royal road. It's almost like rolling out the red carpet, but the red carpet was made up of their cloak, cloaks. Their, and these were very, it was not like today where, you know, you have many of these uh, jackets. You had one, and some people who are richer maybe have had two. That's what John the Baptist said. If you had two, then give some, <laughs> give your cloak to another person. Uh, it wasn't the mass production like today. So they were giving something up. They were allowing it to be dirtied by the donkey's hooves. Um, they were allowing it to be trampled on. And this is worship we lay down our lives. We lay down our lives. Worship is giving up ourselves, giving up our warmth, our comfort, our identity. And it speaks of honor. We want to worship and keep our cloaks on. (laughs) We want to worship and keep our cloaks on and keep our security on and, and, and not give and not lay down. But... This is what real worship looks like. It's a laying down of that which is precious and valuable to us to provide a road. This leads, us, leads, us to, leads me to one of the last points, though I don't really have points in my notes. And that is this whole word, Hosanna. The crowd is shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. And then in Hebrew, Hebrew, Baruch, Atah, Bashem, Adonai, 
which is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and then Hosanna in the highest. Well, what is this word, Hosanna? I just I want to break it down for you. Uh, Anna's mentioned it too. There's two parts to this word. It's ho, Hoshana. This is how you say it in Hebrew. Hoshana. So the first part is Hosha. Uh, Hosha. Hosha. The second part is Na. Now, interesting. I want to focus on the Na, the last part first. Na. Na. What does Na mean? Well, Na is usually translated in Hebrew as please. It is a, uh, like an, in, it's an interjection. It is an interjection which has several meanings, but usually it's used in prayer. For example, in Exodus 34, verse 9, when Moses is pleading with God, he uses na two times. So it used to frustrate me if I heard somebody in prayer say, oh, oh just do this. Just do that, Lord, and maybe use just so much. But then I noticed that in Hebrew, this is, it often wasn't translated, but you would find that in prayer, like Moses, na, na, which is very much like just, just, just do this, Lord, please, please. It is a form of entreaty. So that is the last part of the Hosanna, is the na, this na, this, this, call this please have you ever felt this please lord yes. please lord nah it's it's a prayer it's a prayer it's a calling out to god the next part is hosha this is the whole sha sound is where we get yeshua you know salvation also you find it in the name hosea which is salvation and isaiah you have this sha sound so hosha Hosha is uh, literally to cause to save. So translating this, I think the best way we could translate it, or one of the ways we can translate it, is this, this is a cry. Hosanna is a cry that is saying, please bring salvation. So it sees that only the Messiah can bring salvation. So when they're saying, Hoshana, Hoshana, they're saying, please bring salvation or please save us. This is the sense of it. It is a cry. It's seeing that the Messiah is the only one who truly, truly saves. Hosanna to the son of David. And so here is this, this prayer, this cry but also used in praise, Hoshana, Hoshana. These people were desperate for the Messiah. They were desperate for salvation. They were desperate for God's deliverance. We also need to be this way. Even as we praise God, we also need God, <laughs> right? We praise Him because He's glorious, but we want more of Him. We need Him to come and to save and deliver. And we'll never be fully perfect in this life. This life will always have some brokenness, yes. right? It'll always have some brokenness, some issues, some lack. If we had everything in this life, then why would we even need heaven, right? Why would we need eternal life? So, it's a, it's a longing for the Messiah, longing for a real home, a longing for salvation. And then the last part of this is these words. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And this is why we carry the king. We want people to also say, Who is this? We want to so bring him glory, lay down our lives and carry him that people will say, who is this? Who is this Jesus? Who is this King? And then that is how we do our evangelism, by explaining and revealing who this is. And this is what the crowds answered. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is Jesus. 
Hallelujah. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to pass it on to Daniel. Father, thank you for your word, which is bread, and that feeds us. And I'm praying that it would be a real revelation to us, that we would be carriers of the king, and that we would lay down our cloaks, be like these donkeys too that carried their king, that we would be willing to be humble and serve and carry our cross. We would take the bitterness knowing that what a great privilege it is to to be a servant of our king, to usher our king into places that he's never been before, just like they did with Jerusalem. And Father, right now, we're crying out for our city, Brisbane. We lift up the gates that the king of glory would come into our city, Brisbane, that you would bring such a mighty deliverance. We need your salvation. We need your mercy. We need your power. Your people need you. We need you once again, Messiah. And we know that you also need us in this covenant relationship. Let us be those who carry the blessing of the Lord to every place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, God.